We can now move to questions to the Minister for Health, Social Services and Public Safety. We will start with listed questions. I will call Mr Leslie Cree, who has just arrived. Mr. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, the South Eastern Health and Social Care Trust's public consultation on the future of intermediate care in North Down and Ards closed on the 29th of April uh, 2015. The Trust is currently analysing the consultation responses. The Trust's preferred option is to provide in the future up to 105 intermediate care beds across the area. This would not include the 20-bed 20 20 bed GP unit in Bangor Community Hospital, which is temporarily closed. In deciding whether or not to approve the implementation of this proposal, my department will take into account the extent to which the proposal is consistent with my priorities as set out in the commissioning plan direction, the impact of the proposal on the quality, sustainability and accessibility of services, and assurance in, relationship, in relation to adherence to established standards of service, and the views of public and local community representatives. Mr Cree for supplementary. Thank you, and I thank the Minister for that reply. Minister, I wonder could you tell me and indeed the House, is the proposal to close Northfield House in Donaghadee likely to have any bearing on the Bangor 20-bed unit? Yeah, the, I, I, I was pretty sure that uh, this issue may come up in this context um, because there was, as the, as the member will be aware, uh, the consultation on the closure of the uh, GP, uh, 20 GP beds in um, the Bangor Community Hospital. Uh, was set, as I said previously, in the context of a wider need to provide 105 uh, intermediate beds across uh, the North Down and Ards area. And the, the 14 beds had been identified in Northfield House in Donaghadee, uh, which has now been a um, uh, consultation on its proposed closure uh, is due to start soon on that. Um, that has been, uh, those, those 14 beds were identified as part of that mix of 105 intermediate care beds, so we can understand why the member would want to raise that in the context of the um, GP bed situation in, in Bangor Community Hospital. My understanding, and bear in mind, this is, this is a consultation which is only recently completed. It hasn't come uh, up to me in the department yet, um, although what I will say, and I'm happy to, to, to place on the record the member that I will rigorously and robustly examine that proposal, particularly in the light of the, the issue with Northfield House. But what I am told is that uh, the Trust believe that those um, 14 beds, um, that can be dealt with actually through domiciliary care, so keeping people in their, uh, in their homes and, and out in the community. Um, and, and of course, I would point out, Mr Deputy Speaker, that um, it does not have a direct bearing because well, it, is a, it is a factor in the, in the overall mix. It does not have a direct bearing because of the, the, the obviously the very different type of person, the very different type of patient who would be in Northfield or in those beds in Northfield versus those who would be in the, the 20 GP beds that uh, previously were in, in, in Bangor Community Hospital. But I am happy to, as I, as I consider this, and as I said, I will, will, will rigorously and robustly examine the evidence that comes forward and whatever determination or whatever recommendation the Trust are, are making to me. Call Mr. Alex East. Thank you, Deputy Chair. Could I ask the Minister what estimate is made of how the cost of beds in the independent sector compare with those in the statutory facilities? Yeah. Well, obviously, the, the 105 uh, intermediate beds that I mentioned in response to, to Mr. Cree's question, um, Mr. Deputy Speaker, um, have an element of use and greater use of the independent sector, an independent sector which is actually quite strong in the, the Ards and North Down area. Um, there is a, a, an average cost per bed per annum within the independent sector of just over £30,000 uh, per bed per annum. The weekly cost of a bed at Northfield House is £808, so that equates to uh, roughly £42,000 per bed per annum. Uh, the 20 Bangor Hospital GP beds, by contrast, cost one point, nearly £1.5 million, and that equates to, to roughly £75,000 per bed per annum. So you can see, in a, on a direct uh, contrast, it is a considerably more expensive to provide a bed in, in Bangor Hospital than it would be within the independent sector. I would point out, though, that um, closure of um, Bangor Hospital beds, the 20 beds there, 
wouldn't recover all of that 1.5 million pounds. It would be some of that cost that couldn't be recovered, uh, but there would be an anticipated saving of around 840,000. So on a pure, so on those figures, and I appreciate it's not um, just those figures that obviously we look at on a pure value for money analysis. I suppose it is very clear that the greater use of independent beds, and if you were um, procuring more independent sector beds, you could obviously reduce that price further. On a pure monetary or uh, value for money analysis. The independent sector is obviously much more cost effective, but it isn't just that, that, that that's obviously considered. It is, a, it is a factor, it is a considerable factor, but it's not the only thing that would be examined. Mr. Fergal McKinney. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister? And following uh, the concerns raised over the Transforming Your Care Plan in both the Audit Office report and in the Human Rights Commission report last week, can the Minister accept that it is absolutely paramount that community services, however they present themselves, domiciliary or such as those in Bangor and elsewhere are, are invested in and bolstered? The transforming your care um, still represents a, a cornerstone of my vision for health and social care in Northern Ireland. And I think, I think it, was, it was, I know that the member has been a, a great supporter of transforming your care in recent times, um, and it is something that he has wanted to see um, push forward, and I agree with him. And I think he appreciates the, the resource constraints that I am uh, placed under and my inability to perhaps roll out transforming your car at a pace that he or I and, and the others uh, would want to see. Uh, and that vision of the patient uh, care being wrapped around the patient and the patient being or the person and the service user being looked after in their community or in their home and their home as a hub for their care is something that, that I very much subscribe to. Uh, and I, I want to see that um, enhanced and increased because I think that that is, that is responding appropriately to the needs of the person. Uh, and I think our, our changing uh, population would show that that's what an, an analysis of what people's views are, that that is what people want. That's where people want to be looked after and taken care of. Uh, it, is, it is clearly, as, as I pointed out, I suppose, in a uh, slightly different way to Mr. Easton in response to his question, a more cost effective use of our resources. Um, it's not always the best use for the, pay, for, for the person, but where it is appropriate, I think that's what we should go in for. And that's, that's certainly a vision uh, that I want to see rolled out and progressed as we go along. Um, and as I said before, Transforming Your Car set that vision out very, very clearly, and it is still something that uh, I want to see achieved progressively over time. Mr. Alistair Ross for a question. Mr. Deputy Speaker, number two. Mr Deputy Speaker, with your permission, uh, I want to group uh, questions 2 and 15 together. There can be no doubt that our health service needs reform. Rising demand for services, a growing and ageing population, an increase in chronic conditions, technological advances and scarce resources create serious challenges for health systems across the world. Addressing these challenges requires innovation and transformation. We need a health and social care sector that constantly challenges itself to be better. I want to make it much easier for health and social care staff to promote innovation, whether that is big or small. To enable this, I have established a new strategic leadership group to help support and drive the culture of change and innovation that we need. The focus of our reforms must remain the delivery of person-centred care, with home as the hub of care wherever possible. To deliver that vision, we need to ensure organisational boundaries do not limit the effectiveness of care, and we must continue to ensure people take responsibility for their own health. This was the vision of care set out in Transforming Your Care in 2011, and those remain my priorities for reform. Chief Medical Officer and I are in agreement about the need for reform. His comments reflect the findings of reports like Transforming Your Care, and more recently, that by Sir Liam Donaldson. His report is clear that reform of health and social care services is required to meet the future health and social care needs of the citizens of Northern Ireland. Chief Medical Officer was also rightly very clear that no and slow are not acceptable options in response to the drive for transformation. Mr. Ross, for supplement. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I know that the, the Minister uh, had a reputation for pushing through reform in his previous role, and hope that he will uh, be able to continue that now. And, Given the constraints on public finances, I think more than ever we need to have innovative approaches to, to old solutions. Can I ask him in, in that vein uh, what assessment he makes of the approaches being taken at Antrim Hospital in, in terms of uh, measures that they are taking to not only reduce the pressure on the emergency department but also in improving patient uh, experience when they go to the hospital? Thank the, the, the member for his question, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I visited uh, the emergency department at the Antrim Area Hospital last week, and I know what it's not in his constituent. Uh, constituency, many of his constituents would, would avail of the services provided out of Andrew Maria Hospital. And I think we're, we're all 
well aware of the, the much publicised problems that the emergency mm -hmm. department, the old emergency department in particular at Andrew Maria had in the past. And I have to say the new uh, emergency department is aesthetically a very um, uh, impressive building, um, which has been designed to, try to help to alleviate some of those problems. But I was particularly impressed with several innovations taking place within and around the emergency department. And, and probably the most impressive was the uh, acute assessment unit, which is actually located in the old, um, old emergency department. Um, where GPs can um, speak directly to staff uh, and they can get advice and then can they arrange for a referral to this uh, acute assessment unit and, uh, for, for diagnostics and for, for management. And that can help to alleviate the pressure of the emergency department where people might, might um, I suppose, traditionally just go direct to the emergency department. They can actually go uh, through their GP to the acute assessment unit uh, and they can even be referred from the ED to it, and again, helping to relieve pressures. As a, as a, a recently new father, I'm sure he would be um, impressed as well with the new uh, specific children's area within the emergency department. I hope he never has cause to use it, uh, but having had cause to use emergency departments before, particularly late at night with children, having a separate area where they can be treated differently and separately is, is um, I think, something that's very good. And I was also impressed with the, the telemedicine that is being used there, to, particularly for, for stroke patients. So there are a lot of impressive reforms and innovations going on within our health and social care sector. Not all of them, maybe perhaps, and Mr McKinney mentioned transforming your care previously, not all of them may be branded or badged as transforming your care, but these are things that are happening day in, day out, or right across our health and social care sector. They should be welcomed uh, and they should be celebrated, and they are um, a sign of the way ahead. Mr. Kieran McCarthy. Deputy Speaker, uh, the Minister's uh, party and other parties in this Assembly continually speak about protecting the vulnerable in our community regarding reforming uh, the health uh, service, and there's nobody will object to that. But will the Minister follow the lead given by a former Health Minister in the Assembly, by, uh, namely Mr. Majimsey, when he decided to reverse the decision taken by the Health Department? to reduce the volume of uh, uh, continence products used by the most vulnerable in our society, that is the learning disability. Will the minister undertake to, to stop that as it's been advised from this week onwards? I, I'm, I'm, I'm not aware of the specifics of the issue that the, the member raises. I'm, I'm happy to see Mr. Majimsi rising in his place. He might be able to advise me if he does get called by the speaker. Um, but I. Um, I'm not aware of the specifics of it, but I, but I, co I commit to the member, Mr. Deputy Speaker, to, to examine the issue and revert back to him and, and to see what has happened, what the current position is, and, uh, and if something can be done. I certainly, I certainly do. The member would know that I would, I would, I would seek to always try to do my best in regard to these matters, but I'm happy to take a look at it and see what's possible. I will call Mr. Majumsi for a question. <laughs> and it's, it's not in relation to Mr. McCarthy. I have to say my. Uh, I did my best. Thank you. Yes, uh, absolutely. <laughs> uh, can I ask? And just it's in reference to Antrim uh, A and E, and again, I had a part to play in uh, delivering that. I remind the minister that the four-hour weights for which should be 95%, four-hour weights are down around the 60%. So quite clearly, we need reform. Could I bring him to transforming your care and a? a process which began, we used to call it uh, shift left, we now, uh, uh, Edmund Putz then changed it to transforming your care, but uh, it's getting a, t when will we get, or will we get a published timeline with money, be properly benchmarked, because there is a lot of confusion within the health committee of exactly where we are with this process. It's key, it's essential to keep the patient at the centre of care, and frankly, uh, the committee, I think, as well as many of the officials, appear to be in the Mr. dark Jim exactly where this is going. The question. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, I thank the, the, the member for his uh, oration, and I think it was a couple of, of, of questions included in there. Um, he, 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 is right, um, he is right in respect of, of Antrim area, and I would not be content, nor should any of us be content, with the uh, figures, particularly around four hour weights in the Antrim Area Hospital. It is still short of where the target is. However, um, improvements are being made. I think many of those improvements are down to the innovations that have been taking place within the Northern Trust, within the Antrim Area Hospital. I think we should, we should welcome those innovations. They are having an impact. Um, although, interestingly, um, they are making those improvements at a time whenever 
the number of people coming to the ED at um, uh, Antrim Area Hospital has risen annually from around 70,000 to 75,000 in the last year. So there has been a significant spike in the number of people presenting themselves to the emergency department, yet they are still um, making progress in trying to reach that four-hour uh, target. Um, I'm, I'm aware of this, this point about, um, I think the, the, the point particularly around a published and funded timeline for um, TYC comes from as much from the uh, recommendation contained within the Dolan's and report along the same lines. Um, and, and obviously the Donaldson report is being considered uh, and will be responded to in, in due course. It is not a, I don't think it is, it isn't fair, although I don't appreciate the member wasn't saying this, to say that TYC has not been ruling out. There are many examples of where uh, transforming your care has been implemented in various different areas, new career or new uh, pathways for uh, care through the Northern Ireland Ambulance Service, uh, the establishment of 17 integrated care partnerships, uh, the commencement of the rollout of primary care infrastructure, and there are other examples as well. So things are happening. It's not a case that things aren't happening, Deputy Speaker. Would I like to see more things happening? Absolutely. But he has hit the nail on the head when he talks about, about budget, and he will know, understand the difficulties around budget and the availability of finances. And um, whilst we have been able to invest a considerable amount into TYC over the last number of years, it hasn't been enough to do everything that we would want, and, 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 that, and on that basis, Wayne, then I have made a bid. I have made a bid through the June monitoring round for more funds to um, develop and roll out more of TYC. Well, Mr. Sean Rogers, Deputy Speaker, Minister, thank you for your answers thus far. When, when the trust review um, services they speak about identifying areas for decommissioning, can I ask you? Uh, to outline the cuts in service provision that are cu currently being brought forward by the 105 million trust and in the HSCB um, efficiency savings plan by your department for 2015-2016. I heard a member talk about decommissioning. I thought we'd gone back in, back in time there in this place. Um, there, there are the there is a commissioning plan being brought forward by uh, the Health and Social Care Board. I believe it's due to come forward this week. Uh, and that will obviously outline what is being commissioned for uh, this year. And obviously, there, there are uh, well publicised pressures at which uh, my predecessor and indeed myself acknowledge that the, the department is under. Um, we are still short roughly of about 30 to 40 million pounds in order to just almost to keep, keep going on the previous year's position. That is after having made um, and predicated upon making roughly 157 million pounds worth of savings in year, and we're still short of that 30 to 40 million. And understandably, that will result in, in pressures and, and perhaps people not getting uh, the services that they, they want in the time that they, they, they would like it to be in. Uh, and I think there is an understanding and an acceptance that we are under pressure. A pressure financially that I have to say to the member isn't helped by the fact that um, we are continuing to lose nine and a half million pounds a month because of our inability to move forward, uh, or rather the inability of some in this house to move forward on welfare reform. Uh, and I think there are there's hardly a member, even in the sort of four weeks that I've been in post, there's hardly a member in this House who hasn't written to me about the need for some service development, including several members from his own party, uh, about more for this and more for that. And obviously, the ability of the executive as a whole to do more is inhibited by the fact that we are losing cash to the tune of £2 million a week uh, because of the welfare reform fines that are there. And, and you know, whenever members are writing to me or they're complaining in this House, they're complaining to the local press, those who are in inhibiting the welfare reform legislation from passing would do well to reflect on the fact on their part and our inability as a department to perhaps uh, deliver services at the level that they, or more importantly, their constituents would want. Mr John McCabe. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I'm grateful to the Minister for his replies. Uh, Minister, if I get asked, when transforming your care three and a half years ago, three ministers later, uh, it was to move £83 million originally in uh, this idea of shift left in from acute to community. How much money has actually moved from acute to community at this stage? And does he not need to give a very strong signal out to the community that transforming your care is still alive? Because I find most people I meet in the health sector think it's gone. I can't, I can't lay my hands on, on the exact figures of what have been uh, moved from acute to community. And I'll, if I can't find that, I'll provide that uh, to the member. Um, you know, I, I think that it, it is unfair. I mean, that, that there, is, there has been some discussion, I suppose, over the last couple of weeks around transforming your care, not least at the uh, recent committee meeting. And um, 
about what its position is. And, and I think that there is there has been a lot of it's been something obviously yeah, you would expect me to be reflecting on personally as, as I've come into post. And I think it's not whilst it is, as I said in response to Mr. McKinney, a cornerstone of the vision for health and social care in Northern Ireland moving forward, it isn't the only part of that vision. And that there are many things, and as I said in response to, to Mr. Ross, there are many things going on, many things, many transformations, many innovations that are going on across our, our health and social care service that we should be immensely proud of, that aren't necessarily part of transforming your care. Um, it isn't something that is, is dead by, by any means at all. It is something that continues, not, albeit not at the, as I said previously, not at a pace that perhaps I or, or, or many of the rest of us would want to see, but that is obviously something that has been affected by resources. In the, in the current year, we have just over £15 million pounds of uh, money in the board, which is going to be spent on transformational projects. I have a bid in, as I mentioned, to the June monitoring round, around £5 million pound to progress five transforming your car. Um, projects and there was 1.5 million pounds from the um, change fund, the executive change fund that was secured during the budget to implement three transforming your, your car projects. Um, there has been a, a considerable investment from 2012-13 to 2014-15, 19 million pounds in 12 13 uh, nearly 10 million in 13-14 and again around 8 million pounds, it was 8 million, nearly 10 million pounds in 14-15. Um, has been was allocated to it, and was, the spend was uh, in and around or slightly above that. Um, so yes, money has been spent. Um, it has produced good results around the creation of inter integrated care partnerships, the rollout of primary care infrastructure, around resettlement, uh, around better uh, pathways for the ambulance uh, care pathways in the ambulance service. Minutes. So there are things happening, and it's certainly not something that is dead. It is part of a broader vision for the health service in Northern Ireland. I call Mrs. Brenda Hill for a question. Speaker, question three, please. Mr. Deputy Speaker, since the initial implementation of the Protect Life strategy in late 2006, a wide range of programmes have been put in place to prevent suicide in Northern Ireland. These programmes have been regularly updated and new programmes developed to reflect emerging international evidence of best practice. Suicide prevention services and initiatives include lifeline crisis de-escalation, counselling, training and awareness raising, improved inpatient safety, psychiatry services and hospital emergency departments, bereavement support, suicide cluster emergency response, local research, the self-harm registry, mental health crisis response teams and self-harm intervention. Mr. Deputy Speaker, suicide rates have not changed substantially since 2006, although the fact they did not rise during the economic uh, downturn may be an indication that prevention efforts have had some success. Provisional figures for 2014 show an 11% reduction in suicides on the previous year. This is encouraging, however, rates can fluctuate from year to year. And given the wide, very wide range of influences on suicidal behaviour, it is not possible to assess the impact of a single strategy on suicide rates. Mrs. Hale for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer. And sadly, as we particularly think of Ronan Hughes's family at this time, and unfortunately, too many families know the distress, how distressing suicide is for those left behind, and how the aftermath is incredibly difficult to come to terms with. Can the Minister tell me what actions are being taken to encourage responsible reporting by the media in suspected cases of suicide? Mr. Deputy Speaker, I thank the, the member for, for her question. She's absolutely right. The, the the tragedy and, and the impact of, of suicide is, is particularly in our minds today after the, the news of the tragic death of, of Ronan Hughes, and, and I'm sure uh, I can speak for, for everyone in the House in, in passing our condolences on to, to his family. Um, and reporting suicide, um, I think, presents a range of challenges for our media. On, on the one hand, Deputy Speaker, there is an important role to be played by by the media in Northern Ireland in raising awareness of suicide. Uh, but on the other hand, um, sensationalist reporting can, can distress uh, bereaved families uh, and, and it can run the risk sometimes of uh, encouraging um, copycat suicidal behaviour. So it's, a, it's a, a, and obviously a balance that the, the media have to find in, in, in reporting. Um, media guidelines were issued in, in 2007. Uh, by our, my department to um, uh, our media in Northern Ireland. That was updated then uh, last year, and, and the update took account of advances in technology, particularly around uh, I suppose social media and the internet uh, over that period. The, the public health agency uh, conduct media monitoring. They do that in, in conjunction with uh, Samaritans, and that looks at 
uh, any reporting of suicide or suicides in, in, in Northern Ireland, um, uh, and identifies um, what might be described as insensitive um, reporting. Um, they also try to encourage the media to use different, I suppose, more sensitive terminology around suicide. So talking about died by suicide rather than committed suicide. And I think we can all understand that's that's a, we get used to using a certain lexicon, and that it can be it can be a certain vocabulary, and it can be it can be hard sometimes to change that. Um, and there's also occasionally training for journalists because there can be. Uh, some people moving in and out of newsrooms, and it's important to keep them updated with the, the guidelines. And I can also report that, um, Mr. Speaker, speaking, that a, a new resources in the form of a pact has been issued. A pack has been issued to newsrooms in Northern Ireland to tr again to try to encourage uh, sensitive reporting of what is uh, is obviously tragic events for for families and communities. Ms. Rosalind McCarthy. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers thus far. Um, can I ask the Minister what, what is his view on the University of Ulster's research, which highlighted that 51.7 per cent of people who took their own lives had mental health disorders? Gorham Elwood. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I'm not, not familiar with the, the particular piece of work. I'm happy to familiarise my, my, myself with it. I, I think there, there are, there's obviously there's no uh, one cause of, of suicide, and there are a range of, uh, of reasons, and sometimes we don't even know the reasons why, why people will take their, their own life. Um, um, but obviously there, there, there are connections in many different aspects, with connections with, uh, clearly as a member highlights, with, with people's mental health. Uh, there can be connections with alcohol or, or, or drug abuse, and there's off, uh, a, a sort of developing school of, of thought in Northern Ireland looking at the, the, the sort of spike in the number of suicides in Northern Ireland in and around 2006, and the evidence that has flowed from that. And there are many drawing correlations between uh, the troubles and the end of the troubles and perhaps latent uh, post traumatic stress that might be, um, you know, people may, may, may suffer from. Um, and that causing a, a, an increase in, in suicide. So there, there are no, there's no one particular reason. Mental health is obviously a, a, a clear, uh, significant part of it. And post-traumatic stress uh, will be something that associated with that too. So I'm happy to, to go away and look at the, at the, the um, uh, research that the member talks about. But you know, I think the, the whole House would acknowledge that it is a problem that we are aware of. Uh, it is a, a problem uh, which we have considerable resources applied to. Um, both at, right across the region and sub-regionally as well. Uh, there are many initiatives which are taking place which are uh, and working in conjunction and partnership, and this came up in a, a recent adjournment debate in the House in response to um, Gary Middleton bringing a topic forward about suicide in the, in the North West, um, where partnership with um, community and voluntary sector organisations has greatly helped to uh, improve awareness and also hopefully to, to combat suicide uh, right across the, the province. Mrs. Joanne Dobson. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Does the Minister agree with me that 338 children attending Northern Ireland's emergency care departments for suicidal and self-harm actions or intentions is a shocking statistic? So can the Minister detail specifically what support is available for the under-16s with poor mental health? There's the, I, I do agree with the member. It, it is a, a shocking uh, figure uh, and, and, and a worrying tr upward trend in, in, in that respect, and I think it, it, in some ways it, it is it is it is deeply worrying that that is that, that is something that has come forward. It's, it's perhaps a sign of perhaps better awareness within the community that the peop that young people are able to present themselves. I mean, it, it is not something I suspect that would have been at that level in the in the recent past, but I think a, a greater awareness amongst parents, amongst communities has perhaps been able to bring young people to, to hospital presenting themselves with, with um, suicidal tendencies. Uh, and, and there is obviously then, once, once people come in to that environment, the system will, will, you would, would kick in and, and support those persons, obviously through a community adult adolescent mental health services and, and, and other range of services, many again provided Deputy Speaker through uh, the community and voluntary sector in Northern Ireland will wrap around that individual to, to help them and also to support, just not just to support them, clearly they're the most important person, but to support their families as well uh, to ensure that they get the care that they need. But um, you know, I, I agree in, entirely with the member that you know that is a, a shocking and worryingly high figure. Um, and those are the only those are people young people who are presenting themselves with problems. Obviously there are many more uh, who don't call out for help or ask for help or aren't, aren't caught on by um, aren't spotted by their um, their friends or their family. 
um, and it is something that is deeply worrying that so many young people are, are, are having suicidal, suicidal thoughts and sometimes unfortunately, as we are uh, tragically aware of today, actually taking their own life. That ends the period for listed questions. We will now move on to topical questions. Uh, Mr. Basil McRae is not in his place. Mr. Mike Nesbitt is not in his place. Question one was withdrawn. So we move on to Mr. Cahill Boylan. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And, uh, I ask the Minister, Minister there is a consultation in relation to the Minor Injuries Unit in Armagh City. I am just wondering, would the Minister encourage all those stakeholders uh, who have an interest in it to participate in that consultation, given the number of cuts in those type of facilities in the Armagh area over recent years? Mr. Speaker, yes, yes, I am. I am aware of a um, consultation being conducted by the Southern Health and Social Care Trust in respect of the Arma Minor Injuries Unit, and I understand that that runs until uh, the 11th of September. And of course, I would, uh, while well, not wanting to preempt the outcome of that consultation, I would, uh, would certainly join with the member in encouraging people who have, have an interest in the local community um, to uh, participate in that consultation. Mr. Boyle, for supplementary. I got my last one called August Scone Bwekish Lesson Ayer as Dr. Agra. I could have thank you, Deputy Speaker, and could have thanked the Minister for his answer. But, Minister, looking to the future, would the Minister, um, or has the Minister any plans for future delivery of services within the Armagh City and District area in terms maybe of a health hub? Because we've seen, like I say, a number of cuts over recent years on transfer of jobs out of that area, and maybe a health hub. In, in the centre there would facilitate a number of services in terms of, of GPs and everything else. Would the Minister encourage or have any plans to facilitate a central hub within Armagh City and District? Uh, Mr. Um, Mr Deputy Speaker, I, I, mean, I can assure the, um, the member that at this point in time, whilst there is obviously a consultation on the future of the Armagh uh, Minor Injuries Unit, um, which is being taken forward. Um, all other services that are on site are, are proposed to remain on site, and there is no um, threat to those. I'm looking back on, yeah, I'm, I'm finding the member has mentioned, um, particularly you know, getting a primary care centre um, in the Armagh area, and, and you know, there's sometimes there's a bit of a, and I've, I've noticed very early on in this job, there's a bit of a more or so of media fascination on uh, decisions to close hospitals wholesale. Um, that's not something that is on my agenda. In fact. What I want to see is, is the, um, the further rollout progression of, of what we have seen done to very, very high standards, particularly around cancer care and coronary care, where we have regionalised, specialised centres where there's the, 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 you know, some, in some cases world-class care taking place as we speak, um, but supported by uh, community hospitals such as those in Armagh and elsewhere in Northern Ireland. And I think there is a, there is a vital role to be played by, by those hospitals in supporting uh, net, our networks of acute hospitals uh, across Northern Ireland. In respect of, of, of primary care uh, centre, I believe that um, Arma is earmarked within the Southern Trust for a primary care centre. Um, however, we are moving forward, as a member will maybe appreciate, with Balamina, Bambridge, and Oma, uh, and then we are moving forward with um, a different procurement model for the ones in Lisburn and in Newry, in his constituency as well, and we will evaluate that. Process and then beyond that, then the strategic implementation plan, which is there for to, to roll out the remainder, which would include ARMA. We will assess the future of those and their rollout and the timing and the budget for all of that on the basis of the outcome of the evaluation into um, Lisburn and ARMA, or Lisburn and uh, Newry. Members, I should have pointed out that question four had been withdrawn. Mr. Robin Swan is not in his place. I call Ms. Anna Lowe. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, can I ask the Minister on what legal basis does he think fetal fetal abnormality can be covered by guidance instead of a legislative change, given that the legal advice of the Department under uh, Edwin Pooch said that this wasn't possible? Mr. Deputy Speaker, uh, this is a, another issue which is obviously. Um, in my entry, uh, and it's one that has to be, I believe, and I'm sure the member would agree, 
handled with the, the greatest of, of sensitivity. And that's the, the approach I'm going to take to, to this issue, because we are dealing with a, a small number, yes, but a small number of very sensitive, very difficult cases involving uh, individuals and, and, and families in some of the most difficult uh, of, of circumstances. So I want to at all times, and, and I hope that the House would share this view, bring that degree of sensitivity and appropriate, appropriate handling to, to this issue. My, my concern, and um, be very, very clear, and I've, I've, I've said this publicly already, um, whilst I'm aware that the, the member's um, colleague, my colleague in the Executive, the Minister for Justice, is um, intent on bringing forward legislative change, uh, it, is, it is my view and is a view of many in this House that there is a risk that that, because it is always the case in any piece of legislation that is brought forward, it can get changed, altered, amended through the various processes in this House. It may not make it through all of the processes in this House. And the big concern that I have, uh, Deputy Speaker, is that in a situation where clearly something has to be done in respect of this issue, it is, it is not acceptable to continue on with, with nothing being done, um, that the worst possible outcome for those sorts of difficult cases that may unfold into the future is to do nothing. And I fear and I I'm worry about having no legislative change. Uh, I'm not even, and that's not with any prejudice to nothing has been published, nothing has been put out there, and I'm not even, uh, I'm not committing myself to that, supporting that legislation. But in its absence, and even the fact that it might take some considerable time for that to pass, something has to be done. And I believe that, that new guidance has the potential to deal with many of the issues that um, have, have unfolded in, in the last uh, number of years. And it is on that basis that I will bring forward uh, guidance to the executive in, in, in the not too distant future and make the point that it would not be, is not my guidance, it's guidance that has been um, developed by experts within my department. Call Ms. Lowe for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I thank the Minister for a very comprehensive answer. Can I ask the Minister, <coughs> excuse me, exactly when the guidance will be coming out? I suppose I, I, I can't say when it will be public because there's a process to go through. And I, I, in fact, I, I was discussing it with officials only this morning, uh, and they hope to have the, um, it with me very shortly this week. Uh, obviously, I will take some time to consider it um, before uh, forwarding it on to executive colleagues for hopefully for, for their ar agreement, uh, and then or thereafter there will be a publication of it. And you know, and I think that, and I hope that the, the House can and the member can see the, the motivation that I have in ensuring that. We don't have a situation where nothing is done. Um, and the Minister for Justice has a particular view. Others will have different views. Um, but the one thing that I'm, and, and, and whilst I can't, you know, where I have, I have uh, a view that it may not pass the House, I know that legislation takes time. I think guidance has the potential to uh, deal with many of the issues. I have been discussing uh, the potential of guidance with uh, leading obstetricians and others within Northern Ireland, and I think there is a an acceptance in their part that guidance may have the potential to resolve many of these issues. So it is on that basis uh, that I'd be hoping to bring forward the guidance and, and hope uh, to unite the executive around those and hopefully get the support of this House and, and more to the point, get the support of the, the wider community and people who have been affected. Well, Mr. Martin O'Mullier for a topical well, question. Um, Mr. Deputy Speaker, ADDNI is a, a wonderful children's charity uh, based, as it happens, in South Belfast. Uh, doing wonderful work with children with ADHD. Uh, I know the issue of their uh, financial difficulties has been raised with the minister. They're facing some uh, choppy waters, turbulent times ahead. I was wondering, had the minister given any thought to perhaps meeting ADD and I to discuss their difficulties? Mr. Deputy Speaker, I'm glad that the, the member has raised this because it, it, it gives me an opportunity. I'm, he may have been not expected to get to his question, but I'm glad that he was able to, to raise it nonetheless. Um, in respect of, of the particular question around meeting, I have committed to, and it's in the diary already, to meet with uh, NICFA as an umbrella organisation for the community and voluntary sector, uh, many of whom are affected by the issue that the, the member has particularly raised. And the, me the member is raising an issue which evolves around something which has been described as core funding. And this is core funding, um, Deputy Speaker, which goes to 67 uh, organisations across Northern Ireland. So obviously, when, whenever, and you would expect this uh, in the current climate, um, every spending line is being looked at right across the board, and every department should be doing that, but certainly mine is, given the pressures that it faces. Those 67 organisations are receiving a considerable, uh, many millions of, of um, uh, grants each and every year. Um, 
it is 67 and not 68, and there's no potential to grow it from 60 to 68 or 69, so it is exclusively for 67. That in itself raises some issues for me around procurement, uh, around uh, state aid, around uh, equity and fairness. So there are issues in that respect. What I've also discovered from looking into this issue, which by the way has been an issue that has been around for, for some time, previous ministers in my post have signalled to the sector that reform will be happening to this core funding, um, but that they have been considering how that might be implemented, which is something that I am now doing as well. What I've also found though, from, from examining uh, this core funding is that it is not going to organisations to pay for services. It is, as, as I was looking at one case last week, making a contribution towards the organisation's chief executives and finance director's salary. Um, now, I think we should be focused, particularly in a time whenever we have scarce resources, on providing funding, scarce funding, limited funding, to organisations to provide services that have defined outcomes. And it is in that context that I will look at this issue. And it is not to say that the work of any of those 67 organisations isn't worthwhile, but I hope that the member and indeed others can appreciate the circumstances that we find ourselves in and why I would be looking at it, carrying on the work of, of predecessors. Call Mr. Mullier for supplementary. I suppose um, what I would say to the Minister is that while we await that review and that reform, uh, his colleague Mr. Garvin and I are united in, in one aspect of our concerns for ADD and I. It is that the Belfast Trust has referred over 300 children uh, to ADD and I, uh, children who, who have the ADHD condition, but Belfast Trust doesn't want to pay uh, for, for, for the service. And I think maybe there is an area where the Minister might be able to use his good offices with the Belfast Trust to uh, say to them, if they want the service and need the service, and they do, then they also have to pay the paper. Thank you. Sir, uh, Sir, we got a, a, a different issue. And I'm, I'm happy to, to take that away, have a look at that, examine that, and, um, and whilst it's first and foremost a matter for the trust, I'm happy to, to examine it and, and, and report back to them. Well, Mr. Paul Gervin for topical questions. Thank you very much indeed, and uh, it really just links in directly on the back of uh, the previous question. Do you consider we're getting value for money from? Uh, from the grants that are offered to the community and voluntary sector. Uh, and I appreciate that the, you've mentioned the 67 groups, not all of which maybe are as needy as each other. Some make a better case than others. Mr. Mr. Mulier, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker said that um, he and the, uh, Mr. Garvin were as one. It seems they're also in the league and asking the same, same questions. Um, I, 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 there, there is, I think it is important that in the circumstances that we find ourselves in at this current, at this current time, whenever resources are, are precious, they're limited, they're tight, uh, very, very scarce, and my department's budget is under pressure, like every single other department in this executive, that we do look at the spending that we're doing, and we're ensuring that the spending is getting value for money, but it is also producing outcomes. Um, the core funding, the infrastructure funding, is something that I'm keen to look at. It has been signalled, as I said, in the past to the organisations who have received it that it is something that previous ministers have wanted to uh, move away from the current system, and it has been a matter of uh, transition and how that might be implemented. Um, and I do think that there are questions around whenever there are many organisations, like the aforementioned ADD, um, ADHNI and others, who um, are needing money, that we're, we are giving money to organisations to pay for salaries of staff as opposed to outcomes and better results for our citizens. Mr. Gervin for supplement. Thank the Minister for his answer. And sometimes I, I feel that I'm making my own view here. Sometimes I feel the department are maybe trying to protect what they deliver on many occasions as opposed to sometimes getting better value for money from the community and voluntary sector. But when can these organisations expect to hear about the prospective changes uh, to their funding uh, for the future? Yeah, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I would hope to be able to, uh, because I appreciate that the uncertainty that um, the, the uh, issues around inf the infrastructure fund has, has created for many of these organisations. I have been, uh, um, whilst we'd always like to see speedier decisions and all of these things, I have been carefully considering it because I, I do value the work that the sector does. It is more of a matter of, as I said, limited resources and ensuring that we are getting good value for money and that we are getting outcomes for the money that we are investing that has delayed a, a final decision. Call Mr. Leslie Cree for a very quick question. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. It will indeed be quick. We have touched on the subject. 
Uh, Minister, the Public Health Agency has a duty to advise on uh, care facilities, and, um, including self-harm. Can you update us, please, on just exactly what they are doing at this time? I think the member's question is about, about self-harm, and I think in, in response to uh, Mrs. Hale's que Hale question, outlined a considerable number of ways in which, uh, particularly around suicide uh, and indeed self-harm, there is a lot of work going on, not just by the, the public health agency who do do a lot of work around raising awareness and, and, and so on and so on, trying to be pre prevent self-harm from happening, but also in response to self-harm when it does happen. And there is, a, I think, a, 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 it was, it was, I, I thought it was a. A, a, an impressive list of services that are being provided, uh, both in hospitals, whenever people are presenting themselves with um, uh, issues, counselling, training, um, um, response, and, and, and also intervention in respect of, of self-harm. In specifics around self-harm, I'm happy to come back to the member with a, a greater detail about what is being, being done for people across, across Northern Ireland. We don't have time, unfortunately, for a supplementary, because time is up. And before we move, sorry, point of order. Uh, Deputy Speaker, I, uh, I was not in my, in my place uh, when I was called for a topical question. I had popped out to take a call, but that's, that may excuse or explain, but not excuse. I, I meant no disrespect to the House or the Minister. Other point of order from the Ulster Unionist. To you, the Minister and the House, for not being in my place for topical questions. Lots of contritions today. Uh, before we move on to the adjournment debate, members will take their ease while we change the top table. <laughs>